one thing we have done in preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread is scrutinize our environment. I think you would agree we have been closely examining labels on food, forgotten packages in our freezers, uh, checking our vehicles, maybe vacuuming them, and looking over, over many other things uh, in getting ready for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The why for that is found in what God has commanded us to do. We are to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that entails some things, brethren, and I'd like as a part of observing this first day of Unleavened Bread to review some of the very basics as a beginning part of my sermon. And we will do that by starting in Exodus 12, verses 15 through 20, where God gives the first detailed instructions about keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that falls very closely in line with, of course, the Passover, which came first. I know we addressed in the Passover service the, the fact that people get this section of Scripture kind of mixed up, and I won't go into all the breakout on that, but it's uh, important to understand that the Passover occurs on one day, the 14th, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins on another day, the 15th. But let's note what God is saying here in Exodus 12, verses 15 through 20. <clears throat> Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Now that is actually part of the command. Seven days we eat it. We don't just eat it one day and then forget the rest of the days. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from, shall have removed leaven from your houses. Uh, other scriptures will back that up. That This has to be done before. For whosoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. That person is not obeying God. And as we go through this, there has to be, for us, a consideration of the spiritual application here. If we don't put sin out of our lives, which leaven is a type of, <clears throat> we may well be cut off from God forever. For whoever <clears throat> eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day, there shall be a holy convocation, which we are observing today. And on the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation for you. The Feast of Tabernacles does not have two holy convocations within it. It has the last great day, which is a separate feast. No manner of work shall be done on them, <clears throat> but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this same day I will have brought you your armies out of the land of Egypt, Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread. And that's where people stumble a little bit. <clears throat> this is on the 14th day. The Passover has already occurred on the beginning of the 14th day, which is evening, but now we're talking about another evening, and that's the beginning of the 15th day, the ending of the 14th day. Remember that the days begin in the evening after sundown, with sundown. And it continues until the 21st day of the month at evening, and that's the end. 
For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native to the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all of your dwellings, you shall eat, you shall eat unleavened bread, as the introductory verse here in this section said, you eat unleavened bread for seven days. Now, what does that typify? We have to consider that. We work on putting sin out of our lives continuously during this time. It's more, this ceremonial analogy and application is far reaching from that respect. Exodus 13, verses 3 through 10, and I'll have to apologize for my abnormally rattly voice, but that's uh, like a little lack of sleep. Exodus 13, verses 3 through 10, and as we go forward here, I'm giving you several citations about these days, and I was thinking about back about how much we've actually reviewed these in years past. We have at different times, and I think this is one of those years we can bore in a little bit closer. Exodus 13 and verse 3, And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt. And they went out of Egypt at night, as other scriptures in Deuteronomy in particular point out. So if they went out of Egypt at night, could they have also kept the Passover at night? No. Not on the same period. Out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand, the Lord brought you out of this land, this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Strong deliverance. And our counterpart is that God calls us. The might of that calling and I know I've talked to many over the years, and, well, when did you first come to a knowledge of the truth? And then we can talk about the details. And it's like, brethren, a switch was thrown, and suddenly a surge of power comes in, and you start asking questions, you wonder. And then you get the answers, and you decide whether or not you're going to Act on what God is revealing to you. But it's a strong God that we serve, and he can do these things. And this is an allegory of how mighty our calling is. And if that's true, then how great is the potential that God is offering us? On this day you are going out of the, the, in the month of Abib. And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of, Can of the Canaanites, and I'll do as... Rob did in his sermonette. I'll skip over these particular names. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no leavening or no leavened bread shall be seen among you nor shall leaven be seen among you in all of your quarters. So we get more details as we read more deeply into the instructions here that we, it's not just a matter of not eating something that's leavened. It's a matter of separating yourselves as much as it is possible according to God, what God instructs here. And you shall tell your son in that day saying, this is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came out from Egypt. Egypt is, as other scriptures point out, and as we can infer, a type of this world ruled by Satan. And it also, what happened to Egypt will again happen on a much grander or larger scale. It will happen to the whole world when God puts an end to human and satanic rule and establishes his kingdom through Jesus Christ. It shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's 
law may be in your mouth, for with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. Well, the remarkable things early that our predecessors in the modern age were able to come to was a knowledge of God's holy days, and it opened up the tremendous vista to understanding what God was doing in his plan of salvation, keeping these days. And God wants us to remember and keep these days for sure. Exodus 23 verse 15 mentions this, and I'll highlight a verse from there, mentions this feast. Exodus 23 and verse 15 You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib, for in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. So we see here something else added, that we're to give offerings on this day. And then that's even in more detail in Numbers 28, verses 17 through 25. I won't read the, all of those verses, uh, but that's more of the priestly application of the offerings that were done each day, and God gives very specific indru- instructions regarding that. But I would like to pick up the story in Deuteronomy 16, verses 1 through 8, because yet we see a little bit more of the details. Deuteronomy 16, I'll begin to read in verse 1, Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord your God, for in the month of Abib the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. And of course, the two observances are being spoken of together here. Therefore you shall sacrifice a Passover to the Lord your God from the flock and the herd in the place where the Lord chooses to put his name. And that's another very specific um, instruction from God on what we should be doing is seeking out where the place is that he's put his name. And we find that through the church in the modern times, in our day. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And again, see how these are tied together. And also, without God's understanding and the guidance of his Holy Spirit, we might be in confusion too, but we're not, and we do understand. That is the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt, all the days of your life. Brethren, let's remember our calling, how priceless we considered it when we first were called by God, when we understood, when we took those steps that we were instructed to do, to repent, to be baptized, to have the ministers, to ask the ministers to lay hands on us, and then the response, Response. Now, when we were baptized, there wasn't a magical surge of electricity that flowed through us. But as time went on, we started seeing the fruits of God's Holy Spirit, a willingness, a desire even to keep his laws. Let me continue in verse 4. And no leaven shall be seen among you in all of your territory for seven days, nor shall any of the meat which you sacrifice the first day at twilight, remain overnight until morning. Again, rehearsing some of those instructions that were given in Exodus 12. You may not sacrifice a Passover within any of your gates, which the Lord your God gives you, but at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide, there you shall sacrifice a Passover at twilight, at the going down of the sun, at the time you came out of Egypt. And you shall roast and eat it in the place which the Lord your God chooses. And in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. 
Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day, again showing this, you have to put, by the way, you have to put all the scriptures together to understand that they're two holy days. Some places say that, but you might get confused if you don't use all of the scriptures to come to an understanding, and that's what we do in you know, in our booklets about the holy days specifically, especially the ones on the spring holy days as it applies here. And on the seventh day there shall be a sacred assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work in it. I think it's important for us to also think critically about where we assemble today, are we assembling in the place where God has put his name? Well, it has been decided through the church of God and how God has set and organized this body that we are a part of and has called us to the particular work that he has assigned us. And so we observe the feast as we do and we can do that with a clear conscience because this is, by its roots, where God has placed his name. And that's at various places, not just one, but again, in the administration of the Church of God, people are not doing this in their homes unless, see, there, there are these exceptions. And even in the book of Numbers, talks about keeping a second Passover. There are provisions and administrations in the plan of God for working these things out in the times that we find ourselves. I'd like to point out one thing from Matthew 27, verse 57, relative to this day that we're observing. Matthew 27. And in verse 57, on this day, those many years ago, Jesus Christ was a corpse in a cave with a rock sealing its surface. He was put in that cave right as the sun was going down. He was dead, and he remained dead for three days and three nights. This section fulfills the prophecies of him dying as our Passover lamb. It, it goes on how he was in a, a new cave and a rich man came and talked to Pilate and had the clout to get this done. But think about that as we celebrate our departure, the meaning of Jesus Christ's death so that we can depart from sin. And we have to kind of pause for a moment and realize the significance of what Jesus Christ did. I, if there's one personal lesson that's come across to me, it's kind of what I wrote about in my editorial this week in the update, is the awesome role of Jesus Christ in bringing salvation to who knows how many billions of human beings that will eventually be in the kingdom of God but who he was, the tremendous position that he had in the kingdom of God in heaven as the very son of God. And we can't look lightly at that. And I, again, taking the time to just make reference to Matthew 27. There are other places that talk about that in the Gospels. Now coming a little further forward to the time of the church, <clears throat> the apostle, <clears throat> excuse me, the apostle Paul puts maybe a, not a different spin, but a, a fulfillment of what this day actually means for humanity and particularly for the church at this time. First Corinthians 5 Verses 6 through 8 talks again in tandem about the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread when it refers to the feast. First Corinthians 5 and verse 6 then. 
Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Boy, here's a, the fulcrum of the whole thing. I mean, <laughs> the whole feast is built on this understanding of the role of leaven and what it can do, what we shouldn't allow it to do. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. He's not talking about just the leaven of bread. He goes on, since you truly are unleavened, you are unleavened, he says. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. This is how we keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It adds such a tremendous dimension to our understanding. It's not like the Jews observe the Passover in the days of unleavened bread. There is, and their knowledge is still locked into that historical account in the Old Testament. And to that, they have added so many things that it's a hodgepodge of traditions and yet they keep the calendar and they keep the days, they observe them. And at some point in the future, they will come to understand the real meaning. And the real meaning of this feast for us is that we must scrutinize our lives spiritually and put out sin. That kind of leavening. You know, this is what we were taught to do coming into the Passover. We were to examine ourselves and not to take the Passover in an unworthy manner. That process, brethren, must continue. And so it is continuing as we observe the full seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leaven, it's a type of sin, and it is what we must remove from our lives, not just the physical leaven. We do that as well, to be riveted to the understanding of what God has in mind about using the analogy of leaven. But we must remove sin from our lives. Why? Well, leaven manifests itself, and what does it do? It grows. It continues to expand. So if we apply the analogy, sin, if we let it into our lives, continues to grow if it is not removed. And we are to consider our own position with God and to work on removing those things. Leaven entered, and I've only lightly alluded to this, but leaven entered the religion of the Jews. So much so, and to the point at which they rejected Jesus Christ as a Messiah. They were so blinded by their traditions, their sins. And Jesus warned his disciples against the false doctrines of which the Jews had. It is, he even called it a type of leaven. If you turn to Luke 21 and verse 1, He's not in the verses I will be quoting exactly referring to this particular feast, but the principle of the feast, absolutely. Reading that first verse, in the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, following after Christ because of his miraculous uh, actions, his miracles, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and then he even defines it. He talks about leaven, and he says, the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. 
And that is even further defined in Matthew 23, and I'll pick up just verse 3. But the whole chapter I'm, uh, of Matthew 23 uh, is a chapter in which Christ absolutely scorches the ears of those scribes and Pharisees by showing them their hypocrisy. But in verse 3, therefore, whatever they, the scribes and the Pharisees, tell you to observe, that observe and do. And the general office of administering the laws of God. But do not do according to their works, for they say and they do not do. They could preach, but they didn't practice what they preached. Matthew 16 and verse 6, Matthew 16 and verse 6, Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and he includes now the Sadducees, another of the religious groups. And that particular group, the Sadducees, why did they need to be warned against? Well, it's because of their doctrines. They didn't believe that there was a resurrection. They didn't believe that there was angel or spirit. They had carved out and hollowed out the truth of God to the point that they were just kind of spinning in place <laughs> and trying to protect, I guess, and practice what they thought religion should be. Mark 8, verses 13 through 21 Turn there to Mark 8, verse 13. This kind of rehearses some of the things I've been talking about. And he left them and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. He pulls in a governmental leader and they reasoned among themselves saying, it is because we have no bread. That's why we're in trouble. That's why our Lord and Master is upset with us. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Were they able to understand spiritual truth is what he's essentially asking them there. Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said to him, 12. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. So he said to them, how is it that you do not yet understand? <laughs> He was trying to bring this group of people into an, a spiritual awareness. And that's the way it develops. That spiritual understanding came with the giving of God's Holy Spirit. But there's always that initial phase of growth as someone is called to the truth where their mind can be open. And the more one turns to God and seeks to understand, the more that understanding is likely to come. The hard transition, just like these disciples faced, is to go beyond the physical, the physical removal of leaven, for instance, and use the same principles for our spiritual life. 
Again, we are instructed to eat leavened, eat leavened bread. What kind of bread is that? Well, that's symbolic of righteousness, of obedience. You don't have to remove, um, I'm sorry, we are instructed to eat unleavened bread. Let me correct myself. And what is that like? That's, again, obedience to God. Whereas leavened bread represents sin and disobedience to God. For seven days, we are to picture putting leaven out of our homes. And for seven days, we are to eat unleavened bread, which represents obedience to God. And that is our actions in overcoming sin. Sorry for that confusion. The un and the (laughs) non-un. I'll have to keep uh, clarifying here. I'm going to give you three kind of bullet points about this process we're going through. Things we can think about as this Feast of Unleavened Bread unfolds. Number one, first, turn to God for removing leaven. Or, parenthetically, sin. The Psalms have some things to say about our approach in this. Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24. A lot of Psalms would touch on this, but I'll give you three citations here. Psalm 139, verse 23, Search me, O God, And know my heart, try me, and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. As I've said before, one of the challenging points in a prayer, if you've run out of things to talk to God about, was, God, please correct me where I'm wrong. (laughs) Didn't stand back. Make sure you're serious when you ask that prayer. (laughs) And be very grateful when he responds. Psalm 19 and verse 12. And this plaintive statement by David is so true for all of us. Who can understand his errors? Really? We're so comfortable with them. We've lived with them all of our living lives. So what's wrong with them? Well, what's wrong with them is mirrored by the standards of God as a checkpoint anyway. Then it continues, asking God, cleanse me from secret faults. In the earlier Psalm 139, to emphasize this again, See if there's any wicked way in me. He's talking. And then a really profound scripture because it has such broad meaning. Psalm 51, verse 2. Well, let me just introduce it with verse 1. This is as it talks about David's response when Nathan the prophet went to David and confronted him on God's behalf based on what David had done with Bathsheba. And then having Bathsheba's husband Uriah killed, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, he's saying. And then 
allegorically, this has some applications to what we go through. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. The very symbolic thing that we do when we are baptized and even before when we come before God in repentance, heartfelt repentance, Quite a, this is one of those psalms, if you're just thumbing through the Bible, if you want some inspiration, meaningful inspiration, read this. It's why David was a man after God's own heart. He drifted, he just didn't untie the ship and cast out to sea by himself. He turned back to God, and because of that, David's future is set. Number two, we have a high priest who can help us and is willing to help us remove leaven. Jesus Christ knows that we need help, and he's there to do it. He isn't dead in a cave anymore. He's at the right hand of the living God, and there he intervenes on our behalf when we come before God and ask the Father for forgiveness. We come to him through Jesus Christ, and that's the door that Jesus opened for us. We pray to the Father, and we pray, though, in the name of Jesus Christ, thereby going through him, not praying to Jesus in particular, but to the Father. You know, in his life, he always sought the help of the Father, and that thread of truth runs throughout the accounts of Jesus' life, and in particular, when he was about to be crucified, it's striking that he's prayed the same prayer three times. And I mean, he was in agony as he prayed. And he got help. God sent it, even an angel, or angels, however that may have actually taken place. Hebrews 4 and verse 15 we can count on this scripture, brethren. It is, it is there. You know, we, and many of you have gone through illnesses, and when you experience things personally, it all becomes personal, doesn't it? <laughs> you, you have a different vision or understanding of things. But the faith to just put things in the hands of God really frees up us so that we don't have to agonize. We can just turn loose of it. We can ask. We can always be dutiful in that, and we should. And we need to come before God and ask for help. And we see that if we do, this could be possible for, in verse 15 of Hebrews 4, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. And that's all kinds of weaknesses. But was in all points tempted as we are, yet without leaven. Well, it doesn't actually say leaven there. It says sin. He let no leaven come into his life. No sin. And number three... Brethren, we must do our part in removing leaven. When all of these steps are running together, the experience for us is going to be growth in the direction of God's kingdom. We must do our part. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5 
2 Corinthians <clears throat> Corinthians 13, verse 5, examine yourselves. We did that. Done. D did that, done that. That's all over. No, not hardly. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are failing the test is the, the understanding here. The, the New King James Version says disqualified. And if, again, if you don't pass the test, you're not qualified, of course. You can read the, the New Testament. You can understand the kind of person that Jesus Christ is by what is recorded there. That's the purpose of the New Testament, to reveal our Savior. And when you read that, you, I'm sure you can find some points to work on. We all can. I can. I do. Revelation 18 and verse 4. Revelation 18 and verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. Unless you have to eat and continue to eat the leaven of this world, the ways of this world. He says here, come out of her, my people. Brethren, we are God's people. Look around. Isn't this world that we live in now full of leaven? Physically and spiritually, I mean, there's no second thought about ordering a Big Mac or going out to eat or grabbing loaves of bread off the grocery shelf. They're there. That is this world without it, any understanding of the spiritual application of removing leaven. Okay, those are the three points. Now I'd like to talk about some examples for us to think about to kind of bore in on the fact that this is a process that we're going through. We didn't get it all out this first day, not all of the leaven in, in terms of spiritually. Now, physically, yes, I hope we have, and that's what we're supposed to do. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 8. This is the story of Cain and Abel. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time, his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought in offerings of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And also, I'm sorry, Abel also brought of the firstborn of the flock, which we find to be the command by God in that section in Exodus 12, 13, 14, as all of these days are explained about, and it includes the sacrifice of the firstborn. Abel also brought in of the firstborn of the flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Sin is starting to heat up here like a pot on a hot burner just put down. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, if you obey me, in, a, in other words, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. It's waiting for you. You're going to take a big bite of it. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Boy, what a formula that is. 
you're going to be confronted with sin. You rule over it like Jesus Christ did, tempted in all things, but he didn't do any sins without sin. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. God warned him. It started with a bad attitude. You know, why isn't my sacrifice as good as my brother's? And that jealousy was so inflamed that he killed his brother. Terrible example. Genesis 39, verses 3 through 12, is a whole different account. I know we use this story often. It's about Joseph, and it's about Potiphar's wife, who looked at this young, strapping Hebrew, who is described as you know, handsome in form and appearance in these verses. But she desired him. She want for her to commit adultery with him, and he wasn't having any of it. He says in verse 8, But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has into my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against Potiphar? No, God. How can I sin against God? He knew that sin was lying at the door. He rejected doing anything here because it was wrong. It was sin. First Peter 4, verses 1 through 4. I'm bringing down to just a few examples, something for us to consider in our own experiences now. How many of us have been through this that I'm about to read regarding walking in the truth, the way of life of God, and what happens with those whom we've known and associated with in times past, or maybe still do. First Peter 4 and verse 1, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That doesn't mean you're cutting yourself. That means you're resisting the physical pulls of this time. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, and I might say the world, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. This is the way we used to be. We're not anymore. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them to the same flood of dissipations speaking evil of you for doing so. And Peter goes on to say that, don't worry, you will be vindicated. They will have to give account to God for themselves as long, again, that's with the proviso that we continue to walk righteously, otherwise we will be giving account in the same fashion. James 1 14 through 15. James 1 and verse 14. Notice this process again, and we can hearken back to Cain and Abel. 
But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. You know, there is always a consequence to sin. What about pride, hatred, jealousy, lust, rebellion? The list grows long unless that is removed. We're not getting leaven out of our lives. Now, a little different phase here, too. I want to talk about, as I start heading toward a conclusion, we can help one another, brethren. We're supposed to. We washed one another's feet, which is showing a willingness on our part to serve one another, to do the menial for one another, to truly Get, getting down to the very core need of what people might need help in. Galatians 6, verses 1 through 5. Galatians 6 and verse 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual... Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted and give in to that temptation and end up worse than the brother you wouldn't help. Boy, do we need this. We need help from one another, and we're getting it. I, I, I'm very happy to reflect on the feast days and meeting together with brethren in the love, the true love that's shown. And over the years, we've grown in these things, I believe. And I think we have the fruits of that. And that's encouraging. Continuing, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Just put on the mantle, the mantle of humility when you think about other people. Don't be so haughty, so judgmental, so angry. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. As we help one another, consider ourselves and who we are, flesh like our brother, flesh and bud. Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, just to make this point again about helping one another. Hebrews 10, verse 24, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, Let's help one another get rid of leaven spiritually as the opportunity arrives. And I'm not releasing the hounds here. Uh, that's quite the opposite. Just be willing, brethren, to help when it is needed, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So much the more we can grow, and with the grace of God, we will. I don't think I can overstate how important it is for us to keep all of the feasts of God. We have these feasts as an anchor for our continued work in the church of God, our continued living in the church of God, 
and also for keeping that future, that incomparable future of God's kingdom in mind. Look at the quandary of this world. Tomorrow is going to be celebrated as Easter. This is pagan to its core. And in God's eyes, it's an absolute abomination. Just a few, I'm going to cite three scriptures if you want to just kind of sit back and listen. Isaiah 1 and verse 14, Your new moons, God says, and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of burying them. I can kind of identify with that every time Christmas or Easter, all these things roll around. Suddenly there's a, it's like a whole new kaleidoscope view of the grocery stores, with, you know, Easter bunnies and flowers and all these things that uh, go to make it up. And now they're all a Twitter over the pink moon that's been happening, tying this all into absolute abject paganism. In Hosea 2, verses 9 through 13, he again talks about this, but he says, Israel forgot him. They forgot God in all of these celebrations that they were doing. And then in Amos 5 and verse 21, he said, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. They're not accepted by God. Brethren, we must stand guard against compromise in our observances of God's feast. Making them always new and fresh and never old and tiring. That's how we have to stand accountable before God. This day has been a new day in the plan of God in terms of us hanging on, continuing in the faith, but also maybe getting a little nuanced, better understanding of the the plan of God. Can we say we have removed more leavening since the last Feast of Unleavened Bread? Are we stronger in overcoming sin is what I'm basically saying, that, that we put some sins out of our lives. And I know if we can span that into maybe a decade. Yeah, I can see one or two or three or ten or maybe a lot more. Brethren, this is our calling to overcome sin and to enter God's glorious and eternal kingdom of God.